friends, good morning. Grace to you and peace in the name of God our Father and His Son Jesus Christ our Lord. It's truly a joy to be gathered for worship this Sunday morning. And I want to begin with a uh, question that might sound uh, a little familiar. How many Presbyterians does it take to change a light bulb? Well, you might notice that the sanctuary is a little darker today. That is not based on uh, unwillingness of our congregation to do something about it. And I do want to say thank you to Terry Feather, who uh, went about the task of changing our light bulbs this past week, but has run into a little bit of difficulty. So the answer to the question is, it takes one Presbyterian to change the light bulb, and then a phone call to the electricians to figure out why uh, things are not working properly. Is that fair to say, Terry? Anyway, thank you for your time uh, with a, a long extended pole and then crawling around in, in the attic as well. So uh, say thank you to Terry on your way out. And if you're noticing that the sanctuary is a little darker, uh, we are aware of that and we're working to resolve the problem and hope to have that done by next Sunday. With that being said, I want to also add a couple names to our prayer list. They're names that were shared by email but did not make it to the printed bulletin. And uh, the first is the family of Marjorie Ogburn. Uh, Marjorie was Linda Caldwell's stepmother uh, who passed away this past week and uh, was laid to rest in South Carolina. So we want to continue to be, be in prayer for the Caldwell family as well as the extended family of Marjorie Ogburn. As well, uh, Linda mentioned uh, adding the name Asher Woods to our prayer list. Asher is their grandson who will be having a heart procedure due to a congenital issue. And uh, what is the time frame for that? July 6th. On July 6th, he'll be having a, a heart cath. And uh, so we will be in prayer for the Woods family and Asher in particular with relation to that. This coming weekend will be the 4th of July celebration, and those that uh, might happen to be by the church might notice that the workers of the Family Fun Zone will be using our building on Friday and Saturday as kind of a home base for their volunteers. That's something that has uh, been done annually and is agreed upon, so don't feel as if we have intruders in the church if you do happen to be by and see it being used. Next Sunday, it will be used by a family celebrating, and this hasn't been run past the session yet, so this fits in the category of asking forgiveness before permission. But I got a phone call from uh, Laura Barry Dunham's children wanting to celebrate Laura and her husband's 50th anniversary and use the church uh, fellowship hall to do that. So be looking for an email session, members, for uh, uh, an e-motion to approve the Barry Dunham family for this celebration. But next Sunday afternoon, they will be celebrating. Again, if you see extra people around the church, they are here with our blessing and with our permission. And we certainly uh, love that families want to come home to Bethel First Presbyterian Church for these milestones in, in the uh, lives of their loved ones. Uh, again, just connecting the dots, Laura Barry Dunham is uh, Rachel Dunham's daughter, just, just for those of you who uh, may have needed one extra dimension of connecting lives and names. Any additional uh, calendar concerns or uh, prayer concerns to share at this time? Could, could you speak to, you know the details more than uh, I do. Lindsay Wilson, a professor, passed away this Friday, Thursday, and they have two small children, and she passed away from breast cancer, and her husband was just diagnosed with kidney cancer also. So it's the Coleman Wallace family. Certainly we will be in prayer for the Coleman uh, Wallace family. Wallace, sorry. If you could just write that down. Pass it to me. I'll, I'll try to get that included as well. Yes, Carol. Yes. Yes. I, I'll say what I do know. Charlie Palmer is a 30-year-old, uh, approximately 30-year-old adult uh, with uh, Down syndrome. Uh, he's the son of the Greensburg Ebenezer Pastor Brad Palmer. And this past week, he was taken to Bowling Green Hospital and placed on a ventilator uh, due to a situation where he had multiple complications, a little bit of pneumonia. He had a swollen air passage due to strep throat and tonsillitis and uh, 
had to undergo uh, several days of, of treatment to uh, get from uh, critical care condition to being in stable condition. Uh, my latest communication from Brad is that he is healing from the current situation but has multiple issues going forward. And uh, as an adult with, uh, with Down syndrome, it's a little more confusing to him when he's got IVs, when he's got people poking and prodding. And so uh, his responses to these are often uh, not welcome responses, uh, but, but somewhat, um, uh, he's got conflicted interests, I guess uh, you should say. So is, is that fair to say an assessment of what you all know to be the case? Uh, anyway, Brad Palmer uh, would, would certainly invite our prayers for his son, Charlie, uh, in, in this time of uh, health concern and, and hopeful recovery. And uh, thank you for mentioning that, Carol. We will also, I uh, did not make the bulletin, but we will also recognize the class of 2021 today. Uh, as we celebrate our graduates, and Michelle has some gifts to distribute, and we'll uh, present those at the end of our service before the benediction. But with those additional announcements and prayer requests being shared, uh, may we enter into our time of worship. As we have come from our various homes and various families and various lives, let us stand together with unified hearts as we come before the presence of the living God to be led by God's Spirit in our time of worship. May we be led in this time by the music uh, of the prelude which will help us prepare.
amazing love to be this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Yet because we have faith in Christ, we dare to approach God with confidence and certainty. May we with humble hearts bow before God and neighbor and offer this unison prayer of confession. O oh God, you call us to generosity, but we are to walk in line to those in need. And blind to our own need, open our hearts to your vision of your body. Teach us to give and receive with grateful hearts. Help us to see your eyes and live the attitude of your grace. Friends, it is humbling to realize that Joe, Jesus knows our every weakness and loves us still. May we as people of faith, awaken to the promise of Christ's amazing love. And may we believe and know the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thank you, God.
you're, you're, we also have many things that make us rich. Like if you have family or friends or love, and God tells us that there's more to life than just money. Now I want I you to remember, both of those. you have money and other things? That is awesome, that means you're very rich. So I, we're gonna talk more about that in Children's Church, but let's bow our heads and pray. Oh God, help us to remember that we are rich in so many ways and help us to be generous in giving what you have blessed us with. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Are you ready to go? Hi.
So I begin this morning's message with a, a few questions of uh, how we measure things. And the first question is this, how do you measure height? Well, obviously here in America, we measure it in feet and inches. Maybe other parts of the world we would go measure it with meters, centimeters, millimeters, and so on and so forth. And how do we measure weight? Well, most often we measure it in pounds, instead of standing on that dreaded scale, right? How do we measure things in the kitchen like dry ingredients? We measure them with cups. We measure wet ingredients with ounces. But how do you measure wealth? How do you measure wealth? If you say dollars and dollars alone, you may want to rethink that response. This, according to a Time website article posted a while back, the vast majority of investors with $1 million in assets don't consider themselves wealthy. I will repeat that because it's a little bit uh, hard to swallow, if you will. The vast majority of investors with $1 million in assets don't consider themselves wealthy. Again, this is according to an article posted on Time's website, and it's a statement that comes in reference to a survey of more than 4,000 people. All of the respondents to this survey had more than $250,000 in the bank. Half of those respondents had more than a million dollars in the bank, and they are the ones who don't think that they're rich. Am I missing something? Get this, what's more is even 40% of those who had more than $5 million in the bank did not think that they were rich. <laughs> Again, am I missing something, or what is it that I'm missing in this assessment? So how much does one need these days in order to think of themselves as rich, as wealthy? Remember, uh, statistically, most Americans have very little money if any, I mean, well, savings, that is. It's talking about savings. About half of Americans don't have enough stashed away to cover three months' expenses. And yet, there are these respondents to the Time Magazine survey that have five million in the bank and don't think that they're rich. UBS, uh, another company that has done a recent survey, asked people what they would have to happen in their lives for them to think that they were rich. And the number one answer was that they would have to have no financial constraints on their activities. That's a shift uh, from similar ways of responding. Um, in 2015, for example, the answer to that question was wealth level. My level of wealth would have to change. But moving further into our day and time, people are talk not talking about the level of wealth, but the constraints that that allows or, or does not require. And so you're beginning to see it's a more of a behavioral uh, view of wealth as opposed to a numeric value of it. Again, this 2015 survey found that many people with annual income of more than $100,000 did not think that they were rich, but they thought that those making twice as much were quote unquote truly rich. Again, just reading from some survey results and doing so to offer this conclusion. As to whether or not you're rich, it seems to be tied to who you're comparing your life and your bank accounts to. And I offer those survey comparisons to say this. It doesn't take much effort to decide what the Apostle Paul would think of this conclusion. Because in our reading today, from his writing to the first century Corinthian Christians about offering, he was soliciting for the poor in Jerusalem. <coughs> and soliciting for these needy in Jerusalem, he said, For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. So Paul would take a step back. He would not enter this business of measuring one's wealth and financial status by how much one does or doesn't have, or how much others do or do not have. And further, Paul was talking about money in this passage, but it does not appear that he was trying to be some sort of first century Dave Ramsey of the ancient world. 
fact, his root topic, if we trace it back a little further in the writing, was not money at all. The root topic of Paul's writing was the generous grace of God. So here for us, this is one of those moments that is helpful for us to step back and look at the passage in its context and for us to do a little New Testament 101 of our own. And notice when we look back to the beginning of the chapter, chapter 8, verse 1, we hear Paul talking about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. What is it that's happening here? Well, well Paul is collecting donations, if you will, from the scattered churches that he had planted to help the impoverished Christians who live in Jerusalem. The Macedonian Christians have already responded generously and in fact given even beyond their means, we're told in verse 3. So now to the Corinthian church he's speaking, and as a part of asking the Corinthians to give generously as well, Paul describes for them how these Macedonians begged earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry of the saints. Oh, please, please, please let us. That's kind of what Paul is saying, the Macedonian attitude was, right? And so what is Paul up to here? Is he flattering the uh, Macedonian church or the Corinthian church? Or is he maybe goading the Corinthian church on maybe a little extra nudge, nudge to get them going, right? Some who study scripture and, and write commentary on it have read this as though Paul was being crafty using the exa example of the Macedonians to sort of motivate in a shameful way the Corinthians into giving liberally also. And it's possible to read verse 8, I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others as a supportive statement for this point of view. It's kind of like a parent saying to another child, why can't you be more like your brother or more like your sister, right? Trying to inspire you against that sort of uh, peer pressure. In this case, this would not be keeping up with the Joneses, but keeping up with the Macedonians, right? But it's important for us to read verse 8 as a continuation of the thought that he had started in verse 7, where Paul urges the Corinthians to let their generosity blossom, as have their other spiritual so more of a holistic approach to what generosity is all about. It's not just our dollars, right? As you now excel in everything in faith and speech and knowledge and in utmost eagerness and in your love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. In his biblical commentary on this particular passage of the lectionary, Stephen Paulson points out in this whole passage, Paul is not goading the Corinthian church. It's not a, why can't you be more like your brother, or I hope you will be like your brother or sister. No, he is exhorting them. And in his words, Stephen Paulson says, Paul has an aim at people's hope and faith in which Christ has created them anew, even with a new desire. Paul's in the commentator, adds that such a desire is emboldened to emerge when God's grace has made a new will. Right? When God has transformed a human heart. And then he gives this comparison. He says, what we see here is like a mare who nuzzles her foal into standing on its shaky legs in order to walk and eventually run. Paul says it's time to stand on your own new legs. I can't help but think that as Kentuckians we have a leg up in understanding this image that, that Stephen Paulson is giving. Right? We have so many fond memories of seeing on TV my old Kentucky home with uh, images of that sunrise on the horse farm and the, and the mayor with her foal and the nudging, whether it's in video or, or picture form. We, we know that evolutionary <coughs> process, right? And we've seen it and we've been blessed by it. In one outcome of standing and walking and eventually running in faith. That image should stand for us as a comparison as to what Paul is talking about with the Corinthian church. So here in this text, Paul is doing that nuzzling to the Corinthian church. He's not goading them on by comparing them to the Macedonians and hope that they're just going to 
raise up and say, well, we can collect more than they collected. He's wanting them to mature in their process, process as well. In fact, what he wants for the Corinthians is for them to focus. He's wanting them to fix their gaze upon not another church, but the one who is the head of the whole church. Paul writes, for you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Again, here the measure is not of simple dollars and cents. Paul is talking, of course, about Christ leaving the richness of heaven to walk among us as a servant so that we might come into the richness, not of silver and gold, but the faith of the kingdom of God. Friends, for us, what we should take away is that we should let Paul's words about generosity nuzzle us as well. These are indeed words for the Corinthian congregation, but they're words that speak to all of us who are followers of we might, the respondent, like the respondents to those surveys I began with, we might think that when we have a surplus in our material wealth, we should then give some of that away. But waiting for a surplus is not a good approach to generosity. It's certainly not what Paul is urging here. And according to the survey mentioned earlier, many of us don't think we even have a surplus. The undercurrent that seems to permeate our culture is that we never have, quote unquote, enough, let alone something extra from which we might dig in and share. And the generosity that Paul is talking about, the generosity Paul has in mind, does not begin from surplus, but from desire. Desire to be Christ-like, desire to be gracious, to desire to be people of the kingdom. And it would be easy to turn this into a sermon on church budget matters. You might, in fact, already think that that is what has happened. But really, what I want to speak to is to say that this is a message about generosity in a much broader matter. That being said, I do want to thank you for your generous support to the church's budget. It is going quite well this year, and thank God for that. But back to today's text, Paul is calling for generosity of life. Generosity is an expression of the genuineness of our love in response to the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, we should nurture generosity of spirit in our entire being, including our wallets, yes, but also the other parts of our lives as well. Generosity is not something that should be compartmentalized, but should have continuity with our entire being, with our whole self. We talk about time, talent, and treasure when we talk about budgetary matters. And those would be great categories to talk about generosity as well. It's not just our treasures, but our talents and our time, our sympathy, our compassion, our openness to seeing what is going on in the world around us. But sometimes, sometimes, the need for a generous spirit can become overwhelmed by the daily pressures of Sometimes the difficulty with being generous is not, is not our spiritual understanding of the needs of others, but the restriction of our current situation to actually be open to see those needs around us. So to illustrate what I'm talking about, if you're kind of scratching your head, I, I understand. But to illustrate what I'm talking about, I'll close with this story by Peter Chin. Peter Chen is an author who blogs uh, for Christianity Today on a site called Third Culture. And on this site, he tells of being busy uh, in a busy grocery, grocery store. The backstory is that he had looked at a recipe that he needed to prepare and realized that he was one can of soup short, right? The dreaded one can of soup trip to the grocery store. And so he finds himself already dreading the trip. And now he's there, and the store is busy, and he's got his one can, and he's looking at all these aisles of checkout, and he finds that the shortest aisle is aisle four. There are two sets of customers in front of him. There's a couple at the front of the line, and then a single behind him. 
file for less than 15 items, that's the place I need to be. So he goes and stands, and as he stands there, he's trying to act like he's not upset, but he's realizing that his calculation was off because the couple at the front of the line has the cashier taking things out of their cart. And they're fumbling around in the, in the wife's pocketbook and in the husband's wallet, evidently not able to come up with what they need. He's just growing increasingly incensed that now he's been in this store. One can of soup is now taking him more than 15 minutes, right? Should not happen in this store. Finally, they go on. They, they've got the cloth kind of grocery bags, but he can tell that they're empty. So they walk away empty-handed, and finally the single in front of him goes. And as he gets closer to the front of this line, and as the single completes his transaction, he notices those cans that the cashier took out are similar baby one. And he begins to do a little recalculation about his gruff response to this couple that was just complicating everything, right? And so he does a little reassessment of what's going on. He realizes his insensitivity driven by his time constraints and his hurry uh, did not help him. He, he, he's a guy who would want a child to not go hungry. So he buys that formula and he rushes out into the parking lot chase them down. And I wish I could say that the story ends with him finding the couple, but he, he can't. He can't find them. And he goes to his own car, and he realizes that he has allowed his own personal desire to live life efficiently to get in his way of being who he needed to be as a child of God. And when he went to his car, he sat down in shame. And he realized that it wasn't his selfishness that had prevented him from helping this couple in feeding their baby. Again, he gladly paid for the formula. And he would have done it earlier if he was aware of what was happening. He says, no, it wasn't selfishness. It was enslavement to my own convenience. Interesting phrase, isn't it? It was my enslavement to my own convenience. A more generous spirit would have caused him to at least try to understand what was happening to the couple ahead of him in line. But instead, he viewed them as obstacles to his quick departure from the store. <clears throat> Yet he was enslaved by his own convenience. And I share Peter Chin's story to say this. Paul, the apostle, was absolutely right in telling the Corinthian Christians, and by extension us, that the true measure of generosity is not against others, but against Christ, the head of the church, who, though he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich, truly rich. May we, in our lives, be wealthy in generosity, not just financially, but in our graciousness towards others, in our compassion, in our patience, in our understanding of the needs of those around us. In the hymn that follows our sermon today, we are going to sing these familiar lyrics in the hymn called as partners in Christ's service. Called to ministries of grace, we respond with deep commitment, fresh new lines of faith to trace. May we learn the art of sharing side by side and friend with friend, equal partners in our caring to fulfill God's chosen end. And so today, knowing the true generosity of Christ, may we live lives that prioritize others. May we live lives that allow us to see the needs around us rather than being enslaved by our own convenience. For this is the true measure of wealth. And that is when rich is truly rich. And when blessings and balance of abundance are most fully representative of God's kingdom. Amen and amen. Friends, again, our worship continues now, as I mentioned in song, may we lift up our voices to sing the song I mentioned as we stand, called as partners in Christ's service.
may we, as the ringing continues, state what we believe in the, in the historic confession of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. It's going to be hard to have a moment of silence with this ringing, so let me take a, a personal moment to help the ushers uh, with the sound system. good news is the sound system is turned off. <laughs> Bad news is I think you still hear what I still hear. Yeah. Right? I think it might be one of the light bulbs that, that we need the electrician's help with. Anyway, let's do this. Let's pray anyway, sing our last song, and, and head, on, head on home. Okay? Fair enough. And uh, that being said... Will we, may we bow our hearts and heads together as we turn to God in prayer. Again, uh, additional prayer requests were mentioned this morning. And Carol Whitley had an additional request. Uh, name uh, Mitchell. Johnny. Johnny Mitchell. And can you say a little bit more about that? God, we thank you for your presence in our lives, and we pray that as we bow before you, you might be part of the lives that are mentioned in our church's prayer concerns. For extended and current members of our church family, we pray indeed, including for the lives of Mary and Kara, Bam and Andy, Ray and Bethany, Betty, Janice, Carolyn, Jerry, Sue, and Molly. Lord, hear us as we pray for Sam and Tammy, Kevin and Pat, Michael, Wendell, Nolan, for the Rudzik family, for Raina and Lacey, Debbie and Mary, Joanne. Lord, hear us also as we pray for the Auburn family and the passing of Margie, for Asher and Charlie, the family of Johnny Mitchell, and for the Mollus Coleman family in the difficult situation mentioned earlier. Lord, hear us as well as we pray for Mary Ellen, Kay, Mary Jo, and Cless, and Tandy, for our own congregation in Presbytery of Mid Kentucky, for those serving in our troops at home and abroad, for the Hickeys and the Smiths in their work as missionaries in their careers. Lord, hear us as we offer these prayers for situations that we are familiar with. We extend our prayers to matters of state, nation, and world concerns. And we conclude by praying, as your son taught us, following the pattern that he offered to his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom.
and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Friends, may we again continue to worship as we now receive the tithes and offerings of the morning service.
service. We would like to uh, recognize the graduating class of 2021. And to help with this, I'm turning things over to Michelle. I will be quick, I promise. <laughs> ben Shaw, who is the grandson of Charles and Sue Ellen Shaw, he graduated from Taylor High School in Cleves, Ohio, and he's attending the University of Cincinnati this fall. Sorry, Em. Emily Watkins, daughter of Dr. James and Bonnie Watkins. She graduated from Taylor County High School, and she will be attending the University of Kentucky in the fall. Then we have, you can go back, girl. <laughs> <laughs> then we have our international student, Gabriela De La Garza, who will be coming back to the United States very soon. And she's the daughter of Carlos and Tanya De La Garza. She graduated from the American School Foundation, or ASF, in Mexico City. She will also be attending the University of Kentucky this fall. Also the daughter of Chris, Carlos and Tanya De La Garza, Kristen. She graduated from the University of Kentucky and she will be attending UK Law School this fall. And then finally, Jennifer Mason Lee, granddaughter of Dr. James and Betty Ewing, who graduated with a master's degree from the University of Denver. Let's give them a quick applause before we leave this high pitch I began with the question, how many Presbyterians does it take to change a light bulb? The next question is, how many Presbyterians does it take to get rid of that sound and come back next week to find out the answer. <laughs> Friends, thank you for being here this morning. And as we go into this world, may we go as people of generous hearts and generous lives. As Paul encouraged the Corinthian church, may we uh, understand the true blessing and balance of the abundance that God provides for his children. And may we be channels of grace as we live gracious lives. Go now, knowing the love of God the Father, the mercy and grace of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit, alive and at work in your life. In this day and always, go in God's peace. Amen and amen.